One of the leading alarmists, Gavin Schmidt, insists that the models do explain what we know about the 20th century. We know what happened over the 20th century, right? We know that it's got warmer. We know where it's got warmer. And if you ask the models, why did that happen? And you say, okay, well, yes, basically it's because of the carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere. We have a very good match up until the present day. This is a history of the 20th century. The first one is the model. The weather is a little bit different to what actually happened. The second one are the observations. And we're going through the 1930s. There's variability. There are things going on. But it's all kind of in the noise. As you get towards the 1970s, things are going to start to change. They're going to start to look more similar. He brushes it aside as noise. But what he means is the models make a mess of the evidence up to about 1970. And then they start to correlate reasonably closely with what we know happened. Because they are programmed to predict increased warming in the presence of increased CO2, and that's what they do. The tendentiousness of the computer models was satirized on the BBC's remake of the classic political comedy series, Yes, Prime Minister. Why should the global warming computer models be any more reliable or accurate than the financial ones? Wall Street's computer models were designed to show that subprime mortgage derivatives were low risk. And these global warming computer models are designed to show that global warming is getting worse. You're suggesting what exactly? Well, the computer models leave out nearly all other possible causes except CO2. And then they say, oh, look, CO2 has caused all this global warming. What should there be in terms of a climate change signal based upon, say, a doubling of carbon dioxide? Most models say it's on the order of about two and a half to five degrees Celsius for a doubling of carbon dioxide. However, one of the things we're finding in research is that number is greatly large, and it exp explains exactly why most of these models have said the Earth should have warmed far more than it already has. There's a great deal to dislike about the alarmist models, including the fact that if the data don't fit the theory, they have a, have a habit of discarding the data or synthesizing it, a polite word for making it up. As one example, they've repeatedly said, oh, well, there must have been more aerosols released that year, or oh, there must have been fewer aerosols, not because anybody went out and made any effort to measure how much soot was released into the atmosphere, but simply because it was necessary to salvage what were otherwise inaccurate predictions, even about the very recent past. There's the problem that we don't have reliable temperature measurements even over most of the land surface of the Earth, to say nothing of the oceans, on the basis of which to determine what the temperature was in any given year, even assuming that there is such a thing. We certainly don't have that kind of readings for 1914 or 1217 or a million BC, although we can say with some confidence that it didn't look like this. Then there's the fact that they don't put water vapor and clouds into their models not because they don't matter, but because it's just too complicated to model. So they leave out the most important greenhouse gas and then tell you they've explained everything and predicted everything else. An extraordinary thing about the models is that not even the alarmists say that they work. They're forever telling us, oh, actually, the models failed to predict how bad things are, even though the models are carefully calculated to predict disaster almost no matter what data you feed into them. When they tell us over and over again that our climate is changing, that it is happening faster than they ever predicted. What's incredibly terrifying is things are happening way ahead of scientific projections. Even they don't defend the model's performance, nor should they, because the models can't explain the fact that the 20th century actually saw three fairly sharp warmings, each as sharp as the most recent one, punctuated by two fairly sharp coolings. And those coolings, particularly the one that ended in 1970, spawned panics of their own. There was going to be a coming ice age. Leonard Nimoy did a special on it. Walter Cronkite warned us against it. Time magazine predicted it. The knowledge of these trends, and some sort of attempt to explain them, is crucial. This chart here using NASA data shows a red warming line that is more or less steady since the 19th century, and yet claims that something dramatic happened in the mid-20th. And the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario is even more worried. She says, 20th century normal is gone. So there's the blue stuff, it's comfortable there, maybe even need a sweater, and the red stuff, ah, we're all gonna die. And yet, if you look at the numbers, what you see is that the 20th century normal is a line that rises 
on average through her blue and her red period. It also fluctuates. There's a lot of bouncing around. Climate is like that. But essentially what you see is a trend coming out of the Little Ice Age, which ended in Victorian times, the temperature rising pretty much since Prince Albert died in 1861. And yet we're supposed to believe either that it really started rising in 1970 or that although it kept rising, the reasons why it was rising changed dramatically in roughly 1970. Now this is an extraordinarily vivid illustration of how not to do science. These sorts of commentators are actually claiming that the effect has been going on for centuries, but that the cause only kicked in 50 years ago. That is, that time runs backwards when it comes to man-made global warming. Or else they're arguing that the effect has been constant, but that the cause suddenly changed. And again, that's not real science. It's a meta law of science that cause and effect are constant. If they're not, we have no way of evaluating past evidence, including from laboratory experiments, in order to come up with scientific laws that we can then test and evaluate. As Sebastian Luning put it in introducing himself as co-author of The Neglected Sun, Sebastian Luning is a geoscientist who spent almost 20 years of his working life studying the climate and the Earth's history. Time and again he has asked himself, why is it that natural forces were able to dominate climate events in the past, but today they are believed to have become practically impotent? Is this a realistic assumption? We don't have a general theory of climate and we don't have climate models. What we do have is very specific simulations of very specific periods, which begin with some assumptions about the relationship between key variables, but then proceed to tweak and fine tune and jury rig until they do produce one very small slice of historical time, especially the latter part of the 20th century, at the expense of being unable to explain anything else about the geological past and being unable to generate anything other than that result almost no matter what data you feed into them. The computer models cannot explain the last 5 million years. They can't even explain the last 12,000 years. So we cannot have any confidence in their ability to explain the next 200.